Today we're talking about how bats and mosquitoes are related. And this is an important topic because with climate change, many areas are getting wetter and warmer. And that means more mosquitoes, unfortunately. And did you know that mosquitoes are actually the most dangerous animal aside from other humans in terms of causing human death? Mosquitoes are more dangerous than lions and sharks and tigers and bears and all of them put together. And the reason for that is that mosquitoes are vectors or they carry a lot of different diseases like malaria, dengue, zika. And traditionally, mosquitoes have been controlled by spraying toxic chemicals, which have a lot of their own terrible side effects, like there's studies linking pesticides with infant mortality, not to mention the detriment it has on wildlife like bees and birds. So we're wondering if there can be a better solution and can the solution be bats? Today we're joined by bat expert, bat man himself, Dr. Bruno Tuttle, who has over 60 years of experience studying and working with bats. So thank you so much for joining us today. Well, I'm glad to be here. Teresa is going to be a part of this. She's here with Hi. me. <laughs> Hi, Teresa. I'll be off on the side. Yeah, and Marilyn and Teresa are both uh, founders of Marilyn Tuttle's Bat Conservation. So. So we're very honored to be joined with you guys today. And also, my name is Emily Stanford, and I'm with Bat b and which is a company that sells high-quality bat houses. So, without further ado, um, Dr. Tell, can you tell us how can bats possibly be a solution for pest control? Like, what, what do bats eat? Well, there are no complete solutions for pest control, but the best approach is a balanced one. Prior to World War II, we didn't have pesticides. We didn't protect crops or anything else with chemicals. But after World War II, DDT and other pesticides were hailed as saviors of the world, practically. They were gonna eliminate malaria, produce better crops and everything. But what most people aren't aware of is that within a decade, of the time that uh, pesticides first came into major use, we almost doubled our crop losses. They weren't very effective. They could kill a lot of insects, but you always have more pests than, than predators that control them, natural controls. And so when you spray the pesticides, you end up killing the natural controls of the pests more effectively than the pests. And in fact, I was asked by the state of Wisconsin years ago to investigate a community that had been approached. They, they wanted to hire a company to control mosquitoes with pesticides. And uh, what I found was that the pesticides they're gonna use would kill off most mosquito eating fish within several applications within the course of the first summer they would get rid of 90 percent of the caddis fly larvae that fed on mosquito wigglers they would look really good that first season because they'd have hardly any mosquitoes but then let's say the next season the community decides well this was too expensive it's harming our health uh, whatever we we're going to opt out of this well, then the next year, they're gonna have a terrible mosquito problem because they've killed the major controllers of mosquitoes. And so they're, it's like kind of giving heroin lace candy to kids. You know, <laughs> they're, gonna, they're, gonna like, they're gonna like the initial uh, taste, but they may be very unhappy with the subsequent taste. In the state of New York, there's actually a study that's was conducted, I believe, by the health department, and it's well published in a scientific journal that uh, shows that when they sprayed for uh, encephalitis causing mosquitoes, that uh, over a period of, of uh, you know, over a period of 11 years, they actually increased the number of mosquito vectors by 15 times. Oh my gosh. The mosquitoes actually benefited from the pesticides. Initially, they did get rid, they reduced the overall number of mosquitoes and it appeared to be good. 
But the crazy thing was that they killed off mostly a species that wasn't carrying the disease. And uh, so the species that was actually carrying equine encephalitis prospered. Overall numbers of mosquitoes went down, but the number of mosquitoes that were carrying the disease went up. They failed entirely to reduce the incidence of encephalitis in people and ended up with 15 times more mosquitoes. In fact, today we spray on average 16 million acres, urban acres, with uh, NALID, a, a mosquito toxicant, and uh, that's that's really, really the wrong thing to be doing. Now, that said, there is no foolproof, there, there's no magic bullet to get rid of all mosquitoes. There's some places where if you're gonna live there, you're always gonna have some mosquitoes. But the question is, do you want very few mosquitoes now and face the consequences of far more later, or can you just learn to live with the balance of nature and encourage natural systems? There's a lot you can do to reduce the problems of mosquitoes. First of all, make sure your rain gutters and things aren't catching and holding water. In my experience, when I've, uh, when my wife has complained about mosquitoes, for example, <laughs> last time she complained that she was getting bitten up something terrible, I discovered that one of her flower pots uh, had one of these automated kind of watering systems where you pour water through a funnel and it goes down and collects underneath to always keep the plants properly watered. And she had thought she had a plug in that so mosquitoes couldn't get in, but the plug had fallen out. When I opened it up, there were hundreds of mosquito wigglers in there. In another case, it was a dog pan that, that had water in it. A wheelbarrow can catch water. But you've got to get rid of these uh, transient water sites. I've had a pond in my yard that could have been a major mosquito breeding site, but it wasn't ever because I kept it populated with fish. And the small fish controlled the mosquitoes. And, you know, bats can be a part of solving your mosquito problem. They will help. Uh, there's, you know, people who claim that, that bats don't make any difference on mosquitoes are just plain naive and unaware of reality. There was a study done in, and I believe it was 2009 at the uh, University of Michigan, yes. And it was published in the experimental, uh, see it was published in uh, the Journal of Medical Entomology. And they actually did a controlled test of how much impact bats could have on mosquitoes and showed that the bats were significantly reducing egg laying females, which is the ones you're really wanting, and they're the ones that bite people and give you trouble. And a later study in Wisconsin showed that the two species of bats that most often live in bat houses, the big brown and little brown bats, were eating far more mosquitoes than anybody had yet realized. In fact, the big brown bat, we all thought they were mostly beetle and moth eaters because it's much easier to find hard parts of beetles or scales of moths in the feces when you look at them than it is to find a, a little mosquito. And so we all thought that, for example, big brown bats ate mostly beetles, but it turned out that they were heavily predating on mosquitoes and these two species of bats were eating 15 species of mosquitoes all through the summer and nine of those were ones that carry uh, West Nile virus. Wow, that's amazing. That was in the wild, not even in the laboratory. Is that right? right. Yeah, very cool. So do you know if there are any estimates of how many mosquitoes or other pests bats can eat in a night? Well, there was a study done on Aptescus nielsen I in Sweden that showed that uh, 
One of them was estimated to be able to catch a thousand mosquitoes in a single hour in the wild. And a study done looking at feces remains in Florida estimated that 30,000 southeastern myotis bats uh, were consuming 15 tons of mosquitoes a year. Uh, bats can eat an awful lot of mosquitoes. They're not going, you know, I would never say you put up a bat house and you'll never have another mosquito. That's not. But if you eliminate standing water or what you can't eliminate, populate with fish or, you know, put up bat houses, you can take intelligent steps and dramatically reduce your problem. I've done that at my home. Although I don't, I admit I don't have a bad house because I just don't live in a good place to attract bats to come <laughs> to a bad house. <laughs> so bats are a part of the multifaceted solution. They're not the only solution. Right. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so we have a question from the audience that is, uh, we hung at bat house and how do we encourage bats to come hang out in there? How do you encourage Well, them? first of all, be sure, let me tell you one thing. I, if you have only one bat house, you may very well get bats, but uh, you'll have a better odds if you have two or more bat houses. And the best approach is to put those houses, let's say one in where, this all depends in part on where you live. How, yeah, how, there's lots of variables. What the climate <laughs> is. Uh, if. If you're down here in Texas, it may need less sun than than if you're uh, uh, up north farther. But uh, put one house where it gets more sun, one where it gets less sun. Uh, actually, two or three bad houses would be the minimum I'd put up if I was really, really anxious to do well. Why is that? Well, this is because out in the wild, you know, recently it was said by someone concerned about the welfare of bats that uh, we might be putting up death traps for bats, attracting them from good wild roosts into bat houses that didn't always last long. But truthfully, the bats that come to live in our bat houses aren't abandoning better roosts in the wild to do it. They're desperate bats that have, don't have enough roosts. Mm -hmm. and, uh, even in the wild, bats are accustomed to their roofs falling apart. A good share of the bats that live in bat houses originally lived under loose tree bark on dead snags or in woodpecker holes. And, you know, snags fall down, loose bark falls off. And so you've always got to have in mind where you're going to go next if, you, if your home falls apart. If you're a bat. Right. <laughs> And so they like to move around. They're used to moving around and they like to have different temperatures. Well, they they want to know that they have alternatives. And for example, what if a snake starts really bothering them at one place or a hawk or an owl or something? They want to be able to move to another. Bats do a lot of moving around among roosts, even in nature. It's uh, surprising actually how many bat houses manage to hold a whole colony throughout the season because that's not usually what they do. They usually move around quite a bit. But uh, the more, I would recommend in getting started in an area, I would start with fairly simple bat houses, maybe two or three at least. Put them in warmer and cooler locations. Uh, be sure that they're at least 10 or 12 feet minimum above ground. Uh, be sure that uh, there are no perches, tree limbs or things within 20 feet that owls can perch on to hunt the bats. Uh, be sure you got a quality bat house. Uh, there are a lot of vendors out there that, that are selling houses that are not of high quality. Yeah, don't just buy one from Home Depot or Amazon without checking it out first. Yeah. It's okay. To, it's okay to buy it from those sources. Just be sure that it's a certified house and certified yeah. by somebody who's responsible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're looking for a list of bat house certified bat houses from Dr. Rowan Tuttle, you can go on bat, uh, bat conservation. Uh, sorry, Rowan Tuttle's bat conservation, and there's a list of 
my company's company, Coffee and Bee. Um, that you can look at. <laughs> well, we started certifying bad houses recently because actually no one else is at this time. Certifications where people are claiming to have other certifications, those are certifications by entities that no longer do it but did it at one time. And they're not necessarily covering the newest houses made that may not match up to the specifications that uh, were certified years ago. And we've learned a lot since in in recent years, so that's why the certification is new and and up to date. Yeah, that's very that's important. Right. Yeah, right. We have another question from the audience from the young forager who's asking, um, how many species of bats are there? How many species are there? Yeah. In the U.S., depending on whose latest taxonomy you're following. <laughs> probably 46 to 47, roughly. Uh, worldwide, more than 1,400. Very cool. How many of those eat insects? 70%. <laughs> That's amazing. And how many bats in North America eat insects? About, uh, about 70, per, well, actually, no, it's oh, more yeah. than 70% because we have very few fruit or nectar eaters in, North, in the U.S. So almost 100% of ours eat insects. Yeah, fantastic. And what other insects do bats eat? They eat a, what's interesting, it may be said that bats aren't necessarily specializing on pests, but uh, they're eating what's most abundant. And uh, usually your pest you're worried about is the one that is the insect that's most abundant at the time. Right. <laughs> uh, Bats eat a huge variety of insect pests from mosquitoes to many kinds of beetles and moths. The most harmful, I don't, in my own gardening experience, I don't remember seeing a beetle that was worse than the cucumber beetle. Uh, there's a study done in Indiana that showed that uh, one colony of big brown bats that could easily fit into a bat house could eat enough cucumber beetles to prevent them from laying 33 million eggs in a summer. Uh, that would take care of a whole lot of people's gardens. I mean, I mean that facetiously. Uh, the <laughs> corn earworm and armyworm moths are billion dollar pests in America. Uh, they eat uh, stink bugs, chins, uh, little green bugs that you see in your berry vines, uh, the, the macadamia orchards benefit from bats in South, uh, in uh, South. What? South Africa. <laughs> uh, bats are eating a huge variety of, of insects, but uh, most importantly, they're chowing down on the ones that are most likely to get out of balance and cause us problems. That's great. And how much do, do bats save the U.S. agricultural industry a year? Do you know? Very much? conservatively, even though there are many fewer bats than should be here now, uh, about $22 billion, more than $22 billion a summer. Wow. That's In fact, our Parks and Wildlife Department estimates of $1.4 billion of advantage just in the state of Texas. Wow, that's amazing. And we have another question for the audience from Jessica Clare. Um, is it still good to put up a bat house if you have an area that has outdoor cats? Cats and bats can get along as long as you keep the bat houses high enough up on poles or places where bats where the cats can't climb too near. Uh, if the houses are very, they, they need to be at least, if you've got cats in the yard, the houses should be at least 12 feet above ground. And that's because the bats like drop down, right? And they the, could catch. They drop down to gain flight. Right. And then when they come back in the morning, the young will mill around the entrance waiting to go in and cats can jump up and catch them in the air. Uh, so height is really important to avoid cat. Especially cat if you're in a southern area and you're trying to attract free tail bats, which can be pretty spectacular. You can get 
pretail bats can be attracted literally by the thousands, not thousands, but tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands to bat houses. Just wow. depends on how big, how ambitious you are. Uh, but they tend to drop down more to gain flight than some species, and they would need to be up at least 15 to 20 feet. Uh, but if they're up far enough and you have predator guards on the poles so the cats can't climb up, then they're probably co-inhabitable. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's great to hear. <laughs> And, um, and it's also important that there's no other obstacles, like a pole post nearby or some kind of pile of cat, cats could climb up and rest on and wait. Um, right, absolutely. Uh, all right, so we have another question. Um, what are some of the impacts that wind farms have on bats and how could that be mitigated? That's a huge problem. The latest publication uh, authored by a guy named Smallwood quite a good publication on this subject shows that uh, right well as of 2020 there were already an estimated 3.3 million bats being killed every year by careless use of wind turbines in America that's 3.3 million annually wow that's quite detrimental because bats also take a long time for their populations to recover because they only have one baby or pup every year, unlike most, bats or most, other animals that have many babies. So. Most bats have just one pup a year. Yeah. Big brown bats in the eastern part of the U.S. seem to have more food available and they produce twins. In the west, they produce singletons. Mm. Very nice. But the wind energy, we know it's a problem, but um, we just updated our wind energy resources. It's probably more than we can talk about right now, but um, we just did in the past couple months, update all that stuff on our website. So anyone curious can find that on our resources. You just click learn more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all these things I'm telling you about, mosquitoes, pesticides, wind power, you can find specifically specific resources on our website that will not only verify that information, but will document exactly which journals and which publications that are my sources. Yeah, fantastic. That's always really important. Um, so yeah, so if you go to Merlin Tuttle's uh, link, there's a link tree link in the bio there after the talk. With them. And what Merlin was talking about the, the pesticide stuff, like in the beginning, we have a resource called pesticide addiction and how bats can help. And so that, kind of tells that whole story and um, he basically explained it but if you want to see the citations and you want to read more about it that's there too. That resource will lead you to more than more than 500 publications on pesticides showing exactly how dangerous they are to humans showing that we're using now a billion pounds annually in the United States alone. Uh, those are very serious problems that unfortunately just don't get talked about. Absolutely. And would you say that we are addicted to pesticides? And uh, We're on what entomologists have often referred to as the pesticide treadmill. Our pesticides, as I said earlier, kill more effectively the natural enemies, the predator insects. You see, all insects aren't bad. I mean, many of them are helping us control, keep in balance the insects that do cause us problems but the pesticides don't know good from bad. It's just like if you want to get rid of the bad guys and you go out and you just shoot down every human you see, you're going to do a lot more to get rid of the bad guys. And uh, the natural predators of mosquitoes, for example, or other pests always have smaller populations and reproduce slow, more slowly than the pests that they're pre preying upon. And so when you use pesticides, you're gonna kill a higher proportion of their population, leaving less genetic variability to recover from. They reproduce slow, more slowly, so they can't, like you can kill out 98% of the mosquitoes in a town this year with pesticides, the next year have 100% repopulation. 
you yeah. want to kill 98% of the bats, you will not have, what would you have, you'd have like... Well, <laughs> let me give you an analysis. A, a rat that is pretty common in field areas throughout most of North America, the Hispa cotton rat, can produce one pair in their progeny given a year of total freedom from predators, all the food and shelter they want and everything. A pair of them in a year in their progeny would produce a million. Do wow. the same I mean, they thing. Can, do they the can same have thing. Like every couple of weeks or something. Well, <laughs> work it out. It's an interesting huh, math really? problem. <laughs> you know, let's say the the female can have I don't know the exact numbers right now, but like, let's say ten offspring, yeah. and thirty days later she's weaned those, and thirty days later those are ready to reproduce, and just start mapping it out, and yeah. you'll be amazed at what you come up with. Well, if you do the exact same thing for a pair of bats, you're going to come out with luck with three at the end of the year instead of two. Mm -hmm. So uh, the predator side of this equation is far more vulnerable to our pesticides than, than the pest end of it. Absolutely. And can you put up a bat house if there were pesticides being sprayed on the area nearby, or how long do you think is recommended to wait before installing a bat house above a sprayed area? Well, uh, pesticides aren't all the same. Uh, some are more dangerous than others to bats. Some are sprayed at times and in places that are far more dangerous to bats. I wouldn't say that just because, I mean, if, if you're gonna, not put up a bat house anywhere where pesticides had ever been used, you'd never put up a bat house. I mean, pesticides are pretty prevalent, permeating almost everything these days. So, you know, as an indicator of whether your bat house may be successful or not, you might check and see if bats are attempting to live in buildings anywhere near where you live. Uh, that's a good indicator that bats need shelter and have enough food to survive in the area and aren't being poisoned too much. Uh, they, that doesn't mean they're not being affected by pesticides, but it, it gives you a fighting chance that you're going to succeed. Mm -hmm. that's the, good. The, the more, one of the things that's important in attracting bats to your bat houses I want to mention there was a study in Mediterranean a few years ago that showed that just putting up small bat houses strategically around rice crops actually attracted enough bats to eliminate the need to spray pesticides. But that never would have worked, and the authors realized that it never would have worked if there hadn't been parkland nearby that was protecting natural habitat. So that think about it. You got this field of alfalfa or rice or corn or whatever. After the season when the pests are there to attack it and you harvest it, there's gonna be a long famine where the bats have nothing to eat. They ha this is one of the real reasons why we need biodiversity. We need diverse plants and habitats so that the bats that live in your bat house and may in fact rid your garden of pests are going to have alternative food in the winter, let's say, or so. Well, in the winter, they'll go hibernate, but uh, <laughs> uh, but we'll have alternative food sources when, when the pests aren't there. So ideally, the closer you live to a river or lake that has what we call riparian water edge habitats, mm -hmm. usually you have more natural habitat in those areas. Uh, those are especially good places to put up bad houses. Yeah, that's great. And this, yeah. sorry, this is very similar to a related question from the audience. Is can you put up a bat house in a suburb or in an urban area? You can, and it just depends on on where you live, uh, whether that works or not. Where, if you live where there are free tail bats. <clears throat> It might work. We have, I, I'm just gonna make a 
wild to see if my pants guess here, but <laughs> certainly, certainly several million retail bats living in Austin, Texas. And many of those bats are living right in the center of the big urban area. But these bats are fast flyers. They go up thousands of feet in the sky at night. They can catch tailwinds that drive them at almost 100 miles an hour. They can go to distant places to catch prey. So they're not so restricted. If you have a bat that that has shorter, broader wings and can't fly so fast, we call them the helicopter bats versus the jet bats. The tree tails, I'd call them the jet bats. They can travel a long ways to find food. But the helicopter type bats, they they don't do so well having to go a long ways to find food. So you're not gonna find them in, in urban areas. Uh, your odds of getting bats in urban area are reduced, but uh, if, if you live in, in Texas, you might succeed even in an urban area. And it's not just in Texas. Freetail bats occur all up the West Coast and uh, up at least to North Carolina on the East Coast. And because of climate change, they're actually moving further north. They've shown up now in Tennessee and other places as well. The person asking is from Indiana. No so free tails bats yet in Indiana. You better not hope. You better hope it doesn't get warm enough to invite them clear up there. <laughs> <laughs> but they said they live in a suburb on a kind of a busy street. So is it possible to put like two or three up if you live in like a neighborhood like that? Could you put them all up on your house or? Well, if you, you know, again, everything is relevant to the local situation. If you put them up near a busy street that may not be a problem if the nearest feeding area is the opposite direction they don't fly toward the busy street if the best feeding area is across the busy street that may be a big problem bats do get killed by cars but you can um alternatively you know if you live in an apartment building or something you can start a project to get a bat house in the community garden or in a local park or, you know, you can lead those efforts to get a bat house in your neighborhood. It doesn't necessarily have to be on your own building if it's not possible. Yeah. And, and we always talk about doing a bat house. Uh, we probably ought to be talking about putting up at least two or three smaller ones first. Right. That's, instead of investing in a big bat house before you know for sure you can get bats where you live, it's best to give them two or three choices. And if you get bats in those, then you can experiment on expanding your colony. I am aware of a fair number of cases where people put up a bat house or even a couple bat houses and did it wrong the first time or, or just bought bad bat houses and didn't know any better. And then, but they later experimented with better houses or better placement and start getting some bats. And, and some of those people are now among the most successful bat house users in America and have thousands of bats in their yards. Amazing. So if you can once attract a few, there's a pretty good chance that you can expand the numbers by giving them more varied options or larger houses. And then they'll eat your pets. Exactly. Win-win. Save well, if, they don't, if, if, if they don't eat yours, they'll at least eat your neighbors. Yeah, how far do they go? How far do they go? That depends on the kind of bat you attract. If you attract little brown bats, they're probably going to most heavily feed over a, a river or lake, and they'll go there to feed. Uh, I used to laughingly, when people would call me about mosquito, about bat pro nuisance problems in, when I was in Wisconsin, I'd say, well, I guess that's what you get for living on a lake. And they'd say, how'd you know we lived on a lake? Said, that's where that's where most of the bats are because that's where most of the mosquitoes and other aquatic insects they feed on are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like a good general rule is if there are bugs in the area, there's a good chance there will likely be bats as well. Well, true? biodiversity is key. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be all natural. You, you know, in fact, I've seen instances where I thought that some human disturbance was probably good. A, a mix of, of different types of agriculture and, and 
natural vegetation in an area is good. Mm -hmm. As long as you don't have too much of the unnatural. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, fantastic. Does anyone have any other questions about bats, mosquito control, about bat houses, or any other um, questions before we wrap up? Or Marilyn, is there anything else that um, you wanted to talk more about or touch more on? <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, bless you. <laughs> anything else? Well, I am very concerned about pesticides. Uh, pesticides have been linked. In fact, if you go to my resource on pesticide addiction, uh, they've been linked to virtually every known ailment of humans. I mean, in, increased cancer, increased dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, birth defects, uh, almost anything you can think of have been traced back to being exacerbated by pesticides. And we just cannot afford to keep putting more and more pesticides out each year because we have more and more resistant insects. Mm -hmm. At some point, we've exceeded what the system can handle. And I think we're very close to that right now. And one thing I tell people is every time you lose a bat, you just become that much more in need of pesticides. You know, it's, it's bats or pesticides. What do you like better? <laughs> Absolutely. And are there instances where do bats ever bother people if the bats in the bat house or what are bats record with living near humans? I'm not aware of any instance ever anywhere of a bat house living bat attacking a human or giving them a disease. It's exceedingly rare for bats to transmit disease to any human. We hear a lot about rabies in the United States, but uh, we only have one to two cases of rabies in all the U.S. and Canada combined each year. That's one in hundred. That's just one per like 150 million people or more. And the only, you know, for anybody who doesn't pick up and handle a sick bat and get bitten and then not go and have the bat check, uh, there's almost zero chance of getting the disease from a bat. I mean, look at me, I've studied bats for 65 years, often surrounded by millions at a time in caves. And I mean, I've been as close to more bats. No one else in probably in history has been closer to more bats than me. And I'm still perfectly <laughs> alive and healthy. So lucky. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, fantastic. That's very helpful information. Thank you so much, Dr. Tuttle. You're very right. welcome. Right, so does anyone have any final questions? Um, or else we will call it a day. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. It's been a pleasure having you all. And thank you so much, Dr. Pell, for taking time out of your day to have this talk with us. Take a look at our website. There's a whole bunch more I could have said if I'd had time. <laughs> <laughs> well, <don't worry. laughs> uh, yes. and also, if you want to get your own fat house, feel free to check out fatbb.com and we have several different like single and multi-chamber houses that you can put up to help the bats. All right, well, do you have any like, final or closing remarks? Thank you, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, have a good day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Check out our other videos for more bat house tips and information. And don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.